Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, Jason here from Alliance Corp Property Ex Experts. Uh, really excited to have uh, Dr. Andrew Wilson with us today. Uh, Andrew's joined us because we've got a number of questions coming through about uh, the current state that we're in with regards to our property market. There's a lot happening. We've had to experience COVID and then we're in a moving market. Now we're back into lockdown again nationally. What does this all mean for our markets? Uh, we've got a heap of questions uh, for Andrew, so very excited uh, to, uh, to introduce Andrew. Now, uh, for those of you who don't know, Andrew is one of our chief economists at uh, Housing Market. Uh, he provides comprehensive uh, market intelligence to industry and investor groups uh, around the country and one of Australia's uh, high profile property market commentators. So Andrew, thank you for joining us uh, today. Yes, all good. And um, uh, another, another, as I was saying before, uh, another day in the Zoom room. But, <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, we should all be used to that by now. And uh, we're going to have to, uh, I guess, stay in the Zoom room for a little while to come. But uh, that's okay. It's, uh, it's adapting to change. And Australians are good at adapting to change. And um, we roll up our sleeves and get on with it. And uh, I'm sure that we'll do that now, unfortunately, in lockdown in Melbourne and Sydney. And uh, as we did last year. And, yeah. um, you know, although things are never the same, I think we can look forward with some confidence that uh, when we can get on top of this terrible issue, we'll, uh, we'll just get back to keep on keeping on. Absolutely. And it's funny you mentioned the Zoom room because already we've noticed that a lot of our investor clients um, that purchase, uh, for example, house and land packages, a lot of the builders now, um, a, a designing Zoom rooms yes. into the actual floor plan of, um, you know, uh, of housing moving forward. Yeah. So it's quite interesting, the dynamics and yeah. how, how things have changed yeah. um, with, re with remote uh, working now. So, you know, very interesting topic. Now, look, I guess the first question we have for you, uh, Andrew, with everything that's happening is yeah. that, look, we experienced COVID uh, back in 19. It was a big shock. To the economy it was a big shock to everyone um you know it was very concerning particularly to a lot of investors you know what does this actually mean yeah. and although we were still quite bullish um with our views that this will only ever be short term and and yeah. the fundamentals are still very strong in our market what what do you think were the biggest drivers particularly over the last nine months due to the significant growth that we saw um you know coming back into our markets late sort of 2020 well, look, Jason, the, the characteristic of our house price cycle, our housing markets, really over the last four years, has, we can call it in one word, and that's interruptions. And we have had interruptions to orderly housing market activity. You know, we, we can go back to 2015 when we had APRA, who are the, uh, the uh, financial regulators for the banking system, decided we had too many investors in the market and they instructed banks to reduce their investor numbers. That increased, uh, the banks increased interest rates and restricted lending to investors. And that was the first real hit to the normality of our cycle, I guess, when we had that sort of outside interference, um, which affected investor numbers across the board. It wasn't just in Sydney and Melbourne and particularly Sydney, which had very high investor activity at the time. We sort of go through that and we, we had APRA move back into the market again in 2018 and we really had a crisis of confidence at the end of 2018. There are a lot of predictions that prices would crash by up to 40% in 2019, which was real cloud cuckoo land stuff. And uh, But of course, it did concern the market and buyers and sellers sat on their hands uh, through the end of 2018 into 2019. We then had the the uh, Royal Commission into the banking sector, we had a general election, which uh, a major issue was whether there would be a change to negative gearing. All these things affected confidence in the short term and interrupted that sort of orderly flow of, uh, of activity. But markets did start to pick up early in 2019. I think it was because buyers recognised that because prices had fallen away, that it was a good time to buy, there was value there. And of course, the market picked up momentum through the back half of 2019 when we had three interest rate cuts. And we know the key driver of house price growth are interest rate cuts, lower interest rates, higher prices, higher interest rates, lower prices. So mm -hmm. It's not rocket science. You just have to go back and compare the two, the trends of the two, house price growth and interest rate changes. Mm -hmm. um, and we really did build up a head of steam into 2020. Uh, Jason, markets were, were catching up 
particularly in Melbourne and Sydney, with uh, where they should have been without those interruptions. And affordability was high because of lower interest rates. But of course, um, you know, along came COVID and, uh, you know, we, uh, we hit the pause button again. We put on the brakes. And, and of course, that was because of concerns over the outlook for the economy. Again, there are a lot of negative predictions in terms of the outlook for the housing market and the economy, which really at the end of the day was just a lot of clickbait, you know, um, some of those predictions were never going to be realised. Of course, we were in an unknown uh, situation. We didn't really know how COVID was going to pan out. But once we got out of lockdown, it was again that catch-up market that drove particularly Sydney and Melbourne. And uh, we've seen very, very strong prices growth uh, since then, um, you know, since uh, the end of the lockdowns in autumn last year in Sydney. And, of course, Melbourne had a couple of extra lockdowns in the second half of last year. But once those lockdown restrictions were eased, markets were up and running, and we've seen some of the strongest prices growth we've ever seen um, over the last nine months. Now, the signs pre what we've unfortunately seen with COVID, uh, you know, putting up its ugly head again over the last month was that prices growth was starting to ease. Now, if we put this all quite simply in context, Jason, just to understand why housing markets have moved the way they have over the last four years, if we look back to the previous cyclical price point for Sydney, we go back to 2017. Now, despite all the um, massive price growth that we've had this year and over the past year in Sydney, prices are still up uh, currently around about 17% over the past four years in Sydney, that's average price growth of just 4% per year. Mm. In Melbourne, it's up uh, since that period in 2017, prices in Melbourne are up just 3.5%. Yeah. So yeah. it has been that roller coaster catch up ride. And when we also interestingly compare the other capital city markets over that same period of time, quite interestingly, uh, they've all grown at around 4 or 5% as well. So what that does show you that there is an orderly underlying driver of housing markets. Mm -hmm. and that is really access to finance. I mean, the banks, um, you know, we're fortunate in a way uh, to have a banking sector that is very risk averse. And that's because there's only four banks. So they don't have to take risks, right? Yeah. Um, so we don't get risky lending, which puts a barrier uh, around, the, you know, the, uh, the, the, the lending criteria that we have. So... Uh, if banks won't take risks, then we can't take risks, which means that our house price growth is sustainable. And that's what we were seeing uh, prior to the COVID lockdowns, that uh, affordability issues were starting to push prices growth, uh, start to ease prices growth. And this would have been the end game, Jason, without the lockdown, is that prices growth would have eased because we just can't keep going to the bank asking for, for, for more money right, uh, to pay higher prices if we don't have the either the incomes growth, which we don't have, mm. or the lower interest rates, which we can't have, mm. to sustain higher prices. So it just runs out of steam. I mean, we we're starting to see that happen, Jason, uh, recently. The growth rates were declining in an orderly fashion. Um, but, of course, now we have COVID and all that will do uh, because we probably have a, a higher level of confidence for the outlook now. We know that you know, once lockdown ends, that, you know, life gets back more or less to normal in our housing markets. Mm. So we pick up where we left off, uh, which would be with an easy market, um, but it wouldn't be, you know, affecting the fundamentals of the market going forward. So what COVID does is it just extends the cycle, right? So we're pushing now to, you know, peak growth into 2022, all things, fingers crossed, being positive in terms of COVID, um, and uh, again, it just reinforces the reliability uh, of our uh, of Australian capital city housing markets. Yeah, so it is interesting because just on that, when, when COVID first hit, it was Armageddon, right? No, no. So, you know, there's stories coming out of twenty percent corrections, thirty yeah. percent corrections, forty percent corrections, and as we try to explain to the viewers, you got to understand this is just clickbait, right? So. Even with you know one of the biggest catastrophes that we've had to experience um, in our nation for for a long time, 
um, fundamentally, the property market is very strong. As they say, the saying goes, safe as houses. Yes. You know, like I think nationally, we only lost a couple of percent off the median price, which is next yeah. to nothing. Yes. As we explained to all of our clients, you can't go into property investment having a long-term view and not understand that through the yeah. property cycles, there's going to be periods where the market's going to take a breather and pull back a little bit. It's That's normal. Right. So, you know, it must give buyers a lot of confidence to see that with, with everything that we've experienced, uh, we're still in a position now that had you purchased back yep. then, or even at the start of COVID, today yep. your property would still be worth a, a lot more. Absolutely. And I think the, the other thing, Jason, is that we can even have more uh, certainty about the outlook for our housing markets going forward post-COVID mm. um, because the, you know, the the... The factor that creates the ups and downs, as I said before, are interest rate movements. Now, interest rates aren't going anywhere for a long, long, long time. I mean, if the Reserve Bank could, they'd cut interest rates today, but we don't have any to cut. Um, and, and, you know, despite recent speculation, which in my opinion was complete nonsense, that we were going to see interest rate increases next year, the Reserve Bank has, was absolutely adamant prior to the current shutdown that interest rates weren't going to increase until 2024. And even that was just a sort of a semi-educated guess. I, I, we haven't had an interest rate increase in this country since 2010. So we're a decade away from the last interest rate increase. Mm. And I think even prior to COVID, uh, the current COVID shutdowns, we're as far away from another interest rate increase than we've ever been. Mm. Um, you know, it's going to take a long time to get uh, underlying inflation back to the between two and three percent, which the Reserve Bank looks at as their target. But the really important thing is incomes growth. You know, we are going to struggle, as we have done for a decade, to get incomes growth back to where it was, where we would even think about higher interest rates and uh, a lot of the commentators really I don't know where they did their economics degrees but you know they seem to ignore the fact that you can't increase interest rates even if inflation is rising if you don't have incomes growing mm. because all that means is you put extra costs on downward pressure of, of real incomes you know which just reduces economic activity mm. and like I said we're a long way away from that so the short point to this is that the interest rate genie is back in the bottle Mm. And that is being the, the principal cause of the roller coaster ride. Mm. So we can look forward to a much more predictable and certain outlook for house prices. Um, and uh, it is all about the local factors of supply and demand that will drive individual markets rather than being a hostage to what happens uh, with interest rates. Absolutely. And look, that must be a lot of good news for investors out there. Because, yes. Look, as you mentioned earlier, the low interest rates means uh, larger borrowing capacities, greater serviceability for clients to get out there and either add additional investment properties to their portfolio or those that couldn't get into the property market when interest rates were high had now have an opportunity to do so. But aside from the borrowing capacity increasing, um, I guess what's really comforting for a lot of our investors, particularly our, our first timers, is the fact that you can go into the property market now, buy investment properties that are cash flow positive. Um, we're seeing a lot of properties now that clients are buying, even at low price points of as little as sort of 400 to 450,000 in various areas across Australia, whether it's established properties that we help clients buy or off the plan properties, new properties. And some of these cash flows can be as much as 50 to to $100 uh, a week, um, which is very comforting for someone who is starting and, and building on their uh, property portfolio. Um, with all that said though, um, as you mentioned earlier, it can't go on forever. Um, when do you think that, because when do you think we start to think we're going to start to pull back? Because already we're starting to push, I think it's almost 20% growth yes. uh, in Sydney recently, um, you know, a little bit lesser in the other states. But when do you start to see this? Because I'm a big believer, I don't like when the market's doing this, right? Well, don't worry about that, mate. Not <laughs> that. I just like slow and steady. It's a lot easier to manage expectations with clients and, and give them more comfort. Um, the less volatile, the better. Um, but, but and, and I understand the market needs to take a breather. Um, when do you sort of see that sort of coming into play? Well, we already had seen, as I said, Jason, an easing in price growth. Um, I mean, people don't buy houses every day. You know, there's a lot of unsatisfied demand that's been driving the market. Like I said, we've had all these interruptions over four years. Uh, it's now being satisfied. And affordability is a problem because higher prices mean it takes uh, some buyers out of the market. Um, and, and it's just really an easing of uh, the cycle, which has been 
uh, exaggerated in its heights because it was, you know, had had all these interruptions and it was exaggerated in Melbourne and Sydney in its depths. And um, uh, so I think we'll extend the cycle into next year in terms of growth rates, but it will ease out. I think the outlook for prices growth in a low interest rate environment um, is around about three to four percent per per annum. Mm. Um, a little bit higher in markets, as I said, that have stronger local factors. Um, we're seeing quite strong activity in Brisbane at the moment, southeast Queensland, and there are local drivers that are pushing that market upwards, particularly migration. Uh, and uh, of course, Brisbane is a more affordable market for, um, compared to the southern capital. So those local factors will act to push up prices growth, I believe, by a percent or so. Um, but I think overall, we are going to have a much flatter cycle. It'll certainly still be positive because we still have demand, underlying demand ahead of supply. And that's what's concerned me, is that we haven't been building enough properties uh, mm. over the last uh, five uh, years, even though we've had a, a surge in building through Home Builder um, recently, uh, it's yeah. still not enough to bring us back to a, a position where we're supplying enough for demand. And as you, know, we, we, uh, you mentioned before, what happens when international borders open up mm. um, and we get that demand from you know, increased migration levels, you know, if we are notionally undersupplied, which I, which I firmly believe we are underlying supply is uh, is is um, you know inadequate mm -hmm. for uh, for demand going forward. But uh, again, as I said, I think we're in for a much flatter cycle. It is because the interest rate outlook is certainly benign, uh, but we will have prices growth because of that uh, underlying uh, shortage of property, I believe, which will be uh, a force greater in some capitals uh, compared to others. Mm. Yeah, because it's interesting you mentioned about the international borders because we do have a lot of investors ask about that too. We know that, um, um, you know, a, a lot of those international migrants do tend to settle in some of these growth corridors that yes. are the target for our clients due to affordability. Um, not next year, maybe, but maybe the following year, we could be looking at an intake of up to about 150,000 people. Um, so clearly that's going to have some sort of impact along with the continuing lowering of uh, interest rates and shortage of supply. So I, I would argue, and I'm pretty confident, would you share that confidence in terms of a five-year view that um, our markets fundamentally are still very healthy and, and still have a lot of um, demand drivers there? Oh, absolutely. And um, I, I'm not sure we'll ever get back to those levels of migration that we had uh, prior to COVID. We, we, we were on a per capita basis. Uh, the We had the highest number of migrations per capita of any advanced uh, economy in the world, advanced country in the world. But obviously, you know, there'll be analysis done to see the impact of what is basically zero inflation on our economy, particularly in terms of incomes growth, which has been the real problem in our economy for a decade, uh, whether the, we start to see perhaps higher incomes growth because of less supply coming in from overseas, labour supply mm -hmm. coming in from overseas. But I, I, look, I'm never too fussed about the relationship between migration and property markets. It tends to be much more of a longer term influence on uh, prices, price cycles particularly, um, and it doesn't really manifest itself in the shorter term, such as what happens with interest rates and, uh, you know, a local economic activity. Um, so you know, I think even if we, you know, recover in our migration profile, I, I don't think it's going to have a particularly strong influence uh, on our house price cycle uh, over the short to medium term. I think it may influence some of our rental markets, which no doubt have suffered from uh, the lack of international migrants, not just migrants, but also tourists and business travellers. And that has meant that we've had high levels of supply uh, of vacant properties, particularly in the Melbourne CBD rental market and also in a suburban in a city, Sydney. And, and that's just been a product of uh, a lot of the switch from Airbnb into permanence because of that border shutdown. So those imbalances would be obviously corrected with higher levels of, uh, of international migration and also interstate migration. It's interesting, once our state borders started to open up this year, we did start to see an easing in those high vacancy numbers in the Melbourne CBD and also in inner city of Sydney. And uh, that was because, you know, the Airbnb went back into holiday accommodation uh, and there was plenty of demand for that. But if, again, with closed borders, it means those particular areas uh, will continue to have a surfeit of, uh, of vacant properties. But 
Uh, the offset to that in terms of the rental market is we're seeing a real shortage of houses now almost across the board, houses for rent. And that's, you know, one of the factors is uh, that uh, restricted uh, activity by investors who face the credit squeeze has meant we haven't had, you know, we've had the lowest level of investor uh, activity in our housing markets we've ever had over the last uh, two or three years. It is picking up now. Um, but what that's meant is, of course, we've had a shortage of houses for rent in a number of capital cities uh, and rents have been rising. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, uh, again, that sort of undersupplied market that I'm speaking about. It's not just undersupply from the point of view of new building. It's also undersupply um, from investors, you know, and uh, we're still well below long term market share for investors. They're rising. Yeah. Um, banks are lending to them again. And of course, there's a strong appetite with prices growth as it is. Um, and, um, you know, with all those, you know, other advantages that investors have in this country. But, um, you know, as I said, I still think that, you know, upward pressure on rents is here to stay because of an undersupply of uh, particularly houses. And uh, the real only imbalanced areas are those in the city CBD markets in Melbourne and Sydney. Well, that's good news for investors and good news for our clients because we, we don't target any of those in <laughs> those CBD like well, you know, there was a lot of supply that went into those markets as well, you know. Yeah. And that, was, that they were directed at um, you know, they were small apartment builds that were directed yeah. at, at investors, you know. And it's interesting when you move away from um, those smaller apartments mm -hmm. that you know obviously were were looking for students uh, in the main to uh, you know as tenants. If you if you move outwards. There's plenty of demand for units in the outer, uh, you know, in the suburban areas, uh, and rents are rising quite strongly there. Like I said, uh, we've ignored the fact that you know we've we've sort of moved into this undersupply environment, not just in terms of new build, but also in terms of you know providing adequate rental stock through uh, investor engagement. Absolutely. So look, um, all positive stuff, but just for the moment, like uh, just this is the last question, I guess that we get sometimes is that. What do you? What, what's your advice to any buyers out there that that are really keen to get in the market, but because of the recent lockdowns that we're experiencing nationally, do, do you think there's any reason to pause or hold off on, on those plans? What are your thoughts? Or again, it's just business as usual. This we're going to continue to see because the market's fundamentally strong, whether we have a lockdown now or, or not, as a long-term strategy, it's neither here nor there. Well, look, that's, and I think it's interesting, Jason, that we're actually having a better result, particularly in Sydney, from this lockdown yeah. in terms of what's happening uh, on the ground in the housing market than we did last year. So, you know, the human nature adapts to change and challenges, and the industry and buyers and sellers have adapted. We're adapting now, we're in the Zoom room, um, and there's a lot of transactions that are still occurring. Now, there's no doubt that the number of listings has fallen sharply because people are restricted. Uh, and are also, you know, are, are concerned about the capacity to put the house, a house on the market at the moment. But the point to all that is it's an interruption. So once we get back, fingers crossed, to more of a sense of normality, mm. then those decisions that have been postponed will be activated again. Now, I think that that may work its way into next year, but the point is we'll end up perhaps in autumn next year where we were in autumn last year, if you remember prior to COVID, we had a very strong um, release of demand and very strong prices growth in autumn last year. Now, it is dependent on releasing those restrictions, right? In That's Melbourne, well, see, in Melbourne, you can't inspect a property, right? You can't go and look at a property for rent or to buy. In Sydney, you can still inspect property. So the physical inspection, of course, is, is important when you're thinking of transacting. Um, but the other point is that, the, even though listing numbers are falling, um, we're still seeing prices growth being maintained, which I think is very interesting in Sydney and Melbourne, that prices growth really hasn't fallen away as sharply as it did, even though it's only you know, a few weeks and a month, as it did last year at the same time. And I think that's because people are just accepting this as part of, you know, of, of, a, of a lifestyle rather than you know, um, an impact on their decision to buy or to sell. The decisions have been made. It's just that they're restricted from doing it, so they'll wait until they can do it. And they still, there's still a lot of FOMO out there, Jason. You know, people know that um, you know they want to get into the market when it's up and running again because there is still upside to prices growth. 
Mm. Um, I still think we've got around about to five to ten percent prices growth uh, left in this cycle. So, and that should pan its way uh, if we do get into a, a more acceptable environment in terms of uh, shutdown. I think that'll work its way uh, through to perhaps the middle of next year, uh, end of next year, and. Um, so that, I mean, that's the point. You'll be, you know, once we're in a normal situation, you'll be paying more for a property then than you would now because there's still that sense that it's a good time to buy. Okay. Well, look, Andrew, thank you so much uh, for you joining us today. Um, very yeah. positive news um, on, on the property market, as we've said to all of our clients. Um, even though we've seen a surge in activity, a surge in, in returns, uh, there's still more there to be had. Um, so get out, get out there, guys, get educated. Um, there's some great opportunities. A lot of those properties are also cash flow positive uh, as well. So again, thank you, Andrew. My pleasure, Jason. Thank and, you, mate. And just some advice for you, Andrew, just be very careful with the kids if you're trying to teach them any skateboarding accidents, if uh, any <laughs> viewers are wondering. Yes, yes, yes. I'm trying to teach my 10-year-old how to do an ollie on his skateboard, probably something I should be doing in my mid-40s. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's, it's good that you're out and about. And, uh... oh, you've, got to have, you've got to have a crack. <laughs> That's right, mate. Yeah. My kids are well beyond skateboarding, I hope. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Thanks, Andrew. Mate. We look forward to talking to you yes. again soon. Yeah, absolutely. Good on you, Jason. Bye. Thanks.